Hello fellow Pokemon trainers, my name is Video James, and today I'm going to be saying what Pokemon Elite Four members I thought were the top five toughest. Now keep in mind this video is going to be an opinion video, so if you disagree with it or you think that some members in this video were tougher than others, well, to each his own. Before we start this video, I just want to give off a couple honorable mentions. The first honorable mention is actually going to be the Hoenn Elite Four, and while I did find it to be a intriguing Elite Four and I like the character that they gave to each member, it was extremely easy to blow through it. Like, I could honestly take my Gardevoir and honestly take out this entire Elite Four with four moves and probably only about two full restores. I mean, at most, I'd probably only need to bring my Sceptile as like a backup in case the Gardevoir fainted. Oh, I'm sorry, Carlos who? Oh! You mean the Ash Greninja region. Because let's face it, Ash Greninja and Zygarde are the only things we really remember out of Kalos. Now don't get me wrong, I don't have anything against Pokemon X and Y, but the entire experience was just extremely forgettable. Honestly, the only things I really ever remember out of that region are Greninja, Zygarde, and barely even the rivals. Number 5. Oh, uh, Pokemon Yellow, why are you so memorable? Maybe because you have the Pokemon mascot on you. Nevertheless, a lot of people know about Pokemon Yellow, and for a lot of people, it was the first Pokemon game they picked up. But that doesn't mean it left the greatest first impression, especially when it comes to Lorelei. Lorelei of the Pokemon Yellow Elite, I mean Elite 4, I didn't almost say Elite 1, specializes in water and ice types. Now, you might think, okay, I can kind of just blow through this with Pikachu. Ever heard the saying, easier said than done? With Lorelei, her Pokemon are not only extremely hard to faint with the amount of restoring they can do, but also extremely hard to hit a lot of the time with how much status they can inflict, which can range from anywhere from confusion to freezing to even sleep, which in Pokemon Yellow is a deadly combination. The strategy she's got going on is mostly her Lapras, that that Lapras is very good at shutting you down and has a good plethora of moves to hit you with. And you may think, okay, it's a Lapras that's deceptively easy to take down. Deceptive is a key word there. Lapras can deal a lot more damage than it can take. And if you're thinking of taking her out with Zapdos, let's just remember one tiny thing. Zapdos kinda has a thing when it comes to ice types. Number four. Well, I guess it's about time I put Sinnoh in the ring. When Pokemon Diamond and Pearl came out, let's be honest, we all thought they were the best Pokemon games around. We thought they were the epitome of a Pokemon game. And for a lot of people, they still are. A lot of people still believe that Pokemon Diamond and Pearl were some of the best games to come out of Pokemon. And I gotta say, the Elite Four in Pokemon Diamond and Pearl was probably the most challenging. Even more so than Pokemon Soul Silver, especially considering the poison type user of Pokemon Soul Silver had a dark poison tank. I mean, let's just let's just not talk about that, shall we? And this leads me to Lucian. Now, one of the biggest problems with Lucian was the fact that he possessed one of the most invulnerable Pokemon at the time, a Bronzong. Now, we all know Bronzong has a good couple of weaknesses. But back then, it barely had any. That with its typing, it not only resisted dark because of steel, which resisted dark for a long time, had levitate, which gave it basic immunity to ground types, and let's face it, there weren't really any good fire types in the game unless you started out with Infernape, because Magmar's evolutionary line, you could only get after post-game, and Rapidash is... Rapidash. You can't really get any more than that. It's just Rapidash. Now, of course, Bronzong wasn't the only Pokemon on Lucian's team that actually possessed a problem. In fact, a couple of them actually were very hard to take down, especially that Metacham, considering it possessed basically every elemental punch in the game, including Drain Punch. I mean, what? Seriously, did you fuse Metacham with a Rainbow Rajong? Three. We started rewatching Fairy Tale, one of the best anime ever. Look it up, don't change my mind, link in the description. And I realized how much I actually liked Natsu as a character, so much so that I actually wanted to create a full fire dragon team in Pokemon, but then I realized that there's not that many fire dragons. Which leads me to Flint. 
Now, a lot of people, even the Bulbapedia, consider Flint to be the Fire-type trainer member of the Sinnoh Elite Four. Hmm, yeah, okay, Fire-types, okay. Let's look at this. Let's see how much of a Fire Trainer you actually really are. Okay, we got Rapid Ash, yeah, as a Fire-type. We got an Infernape, yep, yep, Fire-type. Steelix, okay, I guess. Guess you could use that as a fire team. Lopany? Eh, a little weird, but maybe to complement the Infernape? And Driftblim? This is not a fire trainer. This is half of a fire trainer. Now, while all of his Pokemon do possess fire type moves, he's only got two fire type Pokemon. Like, how does this qualify him as the Fire-type member of the Elite Four? If anything, he should be the Rainbow member of the Elite Four. Now, the reason he's so tough is this team is actually well prepared to take on its weaknesses. So, right away, we think Fire-type. Okay, weak to water. Bad news for you, bucko. This team has a lot of ways to counter water, from Sunny Day to Solar Beam. And with Sunny Day, water's power is going to be getting cut in half, so fire types are going to be taking a lot of healing, and a Steelix ain't really going to be taking anything from a water type. Not to mention, Rapidash has Solar Beam, which is devastating to a water type. And if you thought, okay, that Thunder Punch from my from that Infernape isn't going to do anything to this Quagsire. Oh, just wait till they pull out the Solar Beam. Speaking of things you can't do anything against, Driftblim, go pop on a cactus. I mean, really, it's so annoying how this Driftblim can be so hard to hit. With Double Team, this thing's basically making itself invulnerable, and with its Ghost Flying typing, it's going to be resisting any ground types you brought to cake out fire types. Not to mention, this thing has Baton Pass. Yeah, you heard that, Baton Pass, meaning this thing could pass the evasion that it puts on itself onto any one of the number two. You know how a lot of players in Pokemon like to run gimmicky sets like, oh, maybe Murkrow or Slurpuff or Galvantula? Yeah, Karen basically invented that strategy. While her new team does possess a bit of strength, and a good bit of shutting down like her old team, her old team is where the scumminess lies. And I emphasize scumminess. This team has so many ways that it can shut you down, that it can basically put you in a position to where you can't do anything. And to understand how bad this is, there's going to be three Pokemon we gotta look at. So look at that Umbreon. It's got Confuse Ray, which means it can basically put you in a state of where you can't do anything. It's got Mean Look, where it can basically trap you so you can't swap out. It's got Sand Attack to the point where it can make you basically unable to hit the broad side of a freaking Waylord. And it has Faint Attack, so if you thought this thing was going to be a full status thing, Umbreon, you were dead wrong, buddy boy. It's the only shutdown she's got, because she's also got a Vileplume. Now, the Vileplume has Stun Spore. Paralyze was a beast back in Gold and Silver, and even more of a beast in Pokemon Red, Blue, and Yellow. And, let's not forget, this thing also has Moonlight, which basically heals half of its HP. That's bad on an Umbreon. On a Vileplume, even worse. And that Gengar ain't exactly helpful either. That thing can put a curse on you, and then Destiny bonds you down with it. Let's suffice it to say, Karen ain't playing no games today. Number 1. You know how I said that... Karen basically makes your Pokemon useless piles of target practice. Yeah, Agatha perfected this strategy. Agatha was a member of the Elite Four back in Red, Green, and Blue. Now, I ain't talking about the Wimp version of Agatha from Pokemon Red, Blue, and Green. Oh, no. I'm talking about the version from Pokemon Yellow. This was inarguably one of the toughest Elite Four members, if not, and inarguably, the toughest Elite Four member to ever have to fight. Basically, her team perfected the strategy of shutting you down with confusion, healing themselves up, and basically just burning you to the ground to the point where you couldn't do anything. 
Now, while all of her team is capable of this, the main culprit is her Arbok. If you don't know, her Arbok had the move Wrap. And Wrap is a move that, back in Pokemon Yellow, was considered to be God level. Back in Pokemon Yellow, Wrap had the effect of basically preventing your Pokemon from even moving and doing anything as long as Wrap was doing damage. And it had a good amount of chance to actually go for five turns, which could shut you down effectively. And it also possesses Glare, which paralyzes you. Paralyzing you is bad enough, but paralyzing you and putting you in a state where you can't even do anything? That's way too much. But I ain't touching that one with a 20-foot Legiacris Longsword. Those are the top five toughest Elite Four members, in my opinion. Now, like I said... If you have different opinions or you didn't agree with that list, let me know who you thought were the toughest Elite Four members down in the comments. But if you guys did like this video, which I hope you did because I spent a long time working on it, go ahead and give that like button a nice little slap on the Elite Four here. So I hope to see all you beautiful people in the next one.